Good morning. My name is Grace Rimbo Chirenje and I'll be your host for today's service. Welcome to Borodo Community Church to our online service. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And also remember to invite your friends and family and anyone you feel would benefit from this community. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Remember, Zimbabwe is in lockdown, but there are many, many people that still need support of the church and of this Borodo Community Church. I'd like to take this time to remind you to give generously during this time. The details of how you can give and contribute to the broader cause of the church are being flighted on the screen right now. The current statistics on COVID-19 in Zimbabwe are currently shocking. Our curve clearly is on the rise. So I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to look at the information that we as Borodo Community Church are sharing to keep you safe and to keep your loved ones safe from contacting COVID-19. Protect yourself from coronavirus. It can kill you. There are several methods you can adopt to protect yourself and others from getting the deadly coronavirus. Frequently clean your hands by using an alcohol-based product or soap and water, especially after coughing or sneezing, when caring for the sick, after visiting the toilet, before, during and after the preparation of food, and after handling animals or animal waste. When coughing and sneezing, cover your mouth with a flexed elbow or tissue. If you use tissue, discard it immediately into a closed bin. Avoid the consumption of raw or undercooked meat. Avoid close contact with anyone that has a fever and cough. And if you have fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical care early and share information about any recent travels with your healthcare provider. Let's keep coronavirus out. This message was... This is part four of the citizen that God wants. Remember Zimbabwe is at a crossroads. However, it's not a blame game. Citizens have their role and so do leaders. I hope you enjoy today's message where we can learn to become more responsible citizens and also hold our collective leaders accountable. Have fun. Hallelujah. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your all living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly and feel the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves 
when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord so we're singing Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory Welcome once again to this exciting time, not just exciting, but a time where we change our mind frames and our thinking so that it can be clear to us what God wants to do, us, to do with us and with our nation at this hour and at this season. I just want to remind all of us, uh, brethren, uh, that Hebrews 1 verses 8 to 9 says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Just reminding one another, Jesus is on the throne. He, the Lord has ensured that his throne is forever and ever because he has indeed uh, loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. We intend in every way to walk in the steps of our King and Lord who sits on the throne. So we carry on today and we want to talk about the citizen that God wants, and this is uh, part four. And uh, Doc, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kazianike, and uh, greetings to you all. It's good to be back. We are going to continue on this sort of series until we all find a convergence of what is that citizen that God wants. Now, yeah. in the past, we would want to say the citizen that Zimbabwe wants or the citizen that the world wants, but we, we are in search of the citizen that God wants. Because that is eternal, because first we are a citizen of heaven. Mm -hmm. We must never miss this. This is not a, a, a platform where we're just talking about civilian affairs. We're talking about our destiny being heaven. Mm. We're talking about our journey to being eternal. Uh, and we start off by being born again. Mm. We, we must be saved through the blood of Jesus. We must acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Mm. Uh, we must walk in his ways. We must obey his word. We must move in his spirit, the Holy Spirit. We must look up to him on his coming back. We must acknowledge the sacrifice that he made, the struggle that he did. Uh, and so when we're talking about the citizen that God won, we must not miss the objective. The objective is about us being totally saved. And that means we are justified, yes. which means we are saved from our sins. Yes. And then we are sanctified. That means we are being renewed, mm. separated from the, from the world, the thinking of the world. And that the next stage is that when we die, we are being glorified to be like him. Mm. And when he appears, Pastor Pissy, mm. we don't know. John says, we don't know what we will be like. Mm. But when he appears, 
we will be like him. Amen. We will have a new body. Yes. We will have a new name. And we will not have the same pain and suffering that yes. we are having. This is the joy yes. of the gospel. The gospel is liberating. Yes. It's about freedom. Yes. It's about liberty in Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. I, I feel like just preaching oh, now. Oh, I see I you, like were, you, you were in the zone there. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's where we are. In, in, yeah. Um, yes. you. Uh, you're talking something very interesting here when we speak about sacrifice and struggle. And then the important issue you raised there, the issue of arriving at a place of convergence. Because, you know, when you are not a believer or you don't know the goodness of God and you know God, you converge into Christ. Mm. There's another type of convergence I would like you to just clarify and help us this morning. And I want to ask, it seems like there's always a process somehow of sacrifice and struggle that comes with converging people to a common cause. Converging people to a common cause that will bring them into a path of progress, liberty to progress. Oh, yeah. So I'm just asking there and say, can you talk to us a little bit about that? What is that place of convergence and what's that sacrifice and struggle that gets us there? I, I like the way you put it, actually. When you talk about it's a convergence that brings liberty, yes. which then brings progress. progress. Exactly. Wow. I, I like that. I like that. that that's, that's a revelation that we must probably tour in this conversation. Um, the, the, I, I like to talk maybe some pillars or bring some pillars that bring those value proposition. You mm -hmm. know? One of the things that we struggle with as mankind is that we, we don't have a conversation uh, around the values that we want to, uh, to subscribe to. And those values uh, should be the ones that inform the vision of where we want to go. Now, often we start off with the vision of where we want to go without agreeing on the values which will take us to that. Mm. Now, I want us to just discuss or maybe bring to the fore some of the principles that uh, bring uh, people together or that must bring people together or that we must subscribe to. When you bring people together for a cause, there is always that struggle and sacrifice. So we must know that at any given time, because you and I are different, even though we, yes. we, are, we are servants of the Lord, we are yes. friends, we, we fellowship in the same church, you are my leader, um, we still are different. Mm. So there's always a sacrifice that you and I have to go through to continuously remain in a convergent place, yes. which brings liberty, but also brings progress. progress. Uh, and, and so I, 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 there is that struggle. Mm. But there is also a sacrifice. You have to, so you sacrifice certain aspects of your, of your desires, mm. of your preferences. You, you, you sacrifice those. So once we have sacrificed those, I can tell you that then we begin to converge. So mm. there is a, a personal sacrifice one to another. Often we don't get to that place where people want to sacrifice. No, it's always my way or the highway. And, and, and there is a principle that I have always um, um, subscribed to. And Philip, Philip Schaff, Philip Schaff is a, is, a, is a Christian leader, contemporary Christian leader. Yes. He says, in essentials, we must have unity. Yes. So in our struggle for life, in families, mm. in, um, in, in church, in our workplaces, as a nation, uh, we need to establish what are the essentials. So he says that in essentials, we must have unity. Uh, the problem that arises is that when we now are struggling, you and I, and the struggle is at a basic level, we sometimes fail to establish the essential because it becomes a survival approach. I just want to eat my bread. I want to look for food. Yes. Once I get my food, I don't care whether that destroys the other person or not. Mm. And then it becomes a haves and haves not. Those in authority and those who are subjugated or oppressed by them. 
and so on. The, the ones in power and the ones that are not in power. The ones who, um, who are advantaged and the ones who are disadvantaged. The ones who are prejudiced and the ones who are not. Uh, and so, but he says in essentials, there must be unity. So there is no problem in unifying, but there's a problem in establishing what is the essential between what we would call mm. common agenda. Mm. Very important. So we need to establish a common agenda. So in essentials, there must be unity. He goes on further to say, in non-essentials, liberty. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked earlier, or you brought me to a principle to say we need to get to a convergence that brings liberty, yes. which brings progress. progress. So he says in non-essentials, there must be liberty. The problem that we have had in our nation particularly mm -hmm. is that we have struggled to differ with liberty. <laughs> we, always very, think, we always think that if I differ with you, yes. you are now my enemy. This is powerful. So differing in liberty. In liberty. To the say, liberty look, to differ. Because it's not an essential. Yes. The moment we establish an essential, we close rank. Yes. But what has happened in this country in non-essentials? Uh -huh. Even in the clothes that you're wearing. Why are you wearing that uh, piece of cloth? Then we become enemies. And this is what has found us as a nation is, is divided, polarized, and toxic. And that has affected our progress mm. and our prosperity. Indeed. Because we have actually dug in on non-essentials. We have actually differed and fought each other in non-essentials. Much more than we have fought each other on essentials. essentials. So if we establish that the essential thing is that we all want freedom of expression. We all want bread and butter issues to be sorted out. We all want to prosper as a nation. We all want peace and security as a nation. If we say this, and then we say, how do we get together to get this? But guess what always happens? Is that on a non-essential, we go shopping and actually we go killing one another on a non-essential. So yeah, and he says in non-essentials, liberty. And then he also says, we're talking about Philip Scarf here, and he says, in all things, um, in all things, um, uh, um, in, in all things we must unite. Mm -hmm. So in, in non-essentials, he says liberty. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and I think that we, we, we need that we must embrace each other in all things. Mm. We, we mustn't find ourselves getting to, uh, and he says, in all things, charity. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's love one another. Charity mm. here is love. Mm. In all things, we must have love. Now, love does not mean that we conform. Yes. Love means we embrace. That, Pastor Pesci, if we can get that as a people, as families, as husband and wife, as mothers and fathers, as sons and daughters, as mothers and children and fathers and their children and parents and their children. We need to say, look, in all things, there must be charity. We must embrace. What I mean by embrace here that we must never allow our differences to dominate because we uh. should have defined what are the essentials we should have defined what are the non-essentials. So that the essentials became, become a primary focus. A primary focus. But our differences, we must liberate one another. If you, uh, our our non-essentials, rather. Yes. We must say, you go ahead. I don't, I don't really like that. But you know what? It's not an essential for me. Mm -hmm. And it is not affecting the, the essential. Whatever you're doing is a non-essential. But as you do that, just know that I'm still embracing you as my brother. Mm. That we are in charity, we are in love. We work together and I support you even though I wouldn't participate in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So we think that if I can participate in your non-essential, that is when we assess the non-essential between the two of us, it means that we are now divided. So, no, so we have failed to embrace each other in our diversity. This is quite interesting, uh, uh, Dr. Mnyeza. In Philippians chapter 2, from verse 3 to 4, it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. I think it is very important for us to note from where you are coming from that if we are to look out for the interests of others, then in that way things don't affect me, but you seem to like them, I will leave you. That's your opinion. But on the matters that matter, we close rank so that together, one for another, the interests come through. This is really a very strong point. Like that scripture, and to hold on to it, Pastor Pesci, what then brings to that principle, the, the, what brings that, that, the, to a, a principle that I've also held very closely, and it is all for one and one for all. Mm. It means I must stand for you. Yes. But the 10 of us in a room, if I am in trouble with an essential, yes, you must stand for me. That way brings the unity that, that, that uh, uh, we've been talking about here. So it's all for one and one for all mm. on essentials. Yes. And also on love, that we embrace each other regardless of our differences, which are non-essential. Mm. Where there is an essential difference, we must continue to embrace until we find common understanding and common ground. Ah, that's we cool. must not stop embracing. Now, what we often do is that we then just talk about them and us. For example, Zimbabwe is divided as if we've been in a civil war for the past 20 years. It is because we have not found common ground mm. to find each other. Mm. And so that we have that convergence mm -hmm. that brings liberty. liberty. Yes. Why you say liberty there, and I'm excited about that, is that you're saying liberty because we are saying we're different people, but we must embrace. Mm. Yes, indeed. And that should give us progress. We have failed to make progress because it doesn't matter whether what I am doing is to your good because we differ. And most of the time we're differing on non-essentials. Your cause is just to pull me down for that good thing I'm doing. So it has nothing to do with, oh no, because he is doing the right thing, even though I don't agree with him on that thing that he does, yes. on this essential common good, I am going to stand with them and embrace them. Um, God already, <laughs> when God wanted to save mankind, he knew that there was going to be a struggle. There was going to be a sacrifice. So he sent his son, Jesus. But it, the, he knew that his son would suffer. That's the struggle. Yes. But he knew that his son would die. That was a sacrifice. But what was it? It was to bring us to a convergence. Now, you call it convergence. But scripture says to bring us to communion with the Father. Yes. That we now have one source to salvation. Yes. One way to salvation. And that is Jesus, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So we need to converge at a place where the, the, the place of sacrifice and the place of struggle is centralized to a godly one. Yes. And not to an individual one. And I'm going to go into that, Pastor Pesci, mm. because so many times we get caught up who has made the biggest struggle, who has made the biggest sacrifice, and therefore we want to converge around that person. Yes. And we fail to converge around a cause now. Because when Jesus made the, the struggle and the sacrifice, he made it clear that there would not need for another sacrifice, but the only sacrifice we would now make you and I is for a cause. Yes. It's for a cause that is aligned to a godly cause. Now, that helps us. One, once we understand that, we do not centralize or personalize sacrifices. We don't, because there's no need for that sacrifice. Aha. Uh -huh. Because we have personalized sacrifices and made demigods on those people who have made the sacrifice for us. So when I sacrifice, I am entitled, as it were, to rights that are gained because I sacrificed. Yes. Sac personal sacrifice that is not God-centered leads to entitlement. Can you say that again? That, that, that is quite yeah. a statement there. Eh? Personal sacrifice. Yes. 
and struggle yes. that is not God-centered yes. leads to entitlement which oppresses those who are supposed to be liberated. So it's a liberation that does not bring freedom. It's a pseudo-liberation. Now, that goes back, like in this country, for example. The sacrifice that was made by those who died in the war of liberation was genuine. People died. But that sacrifice wasn't for them to be entitled. But later on, we discovered that that sacrifice actually led some today who feel more entitled is Zimbabweans. And now because they feel more entitled than Zimbabweans, they have gone on to oppress others. And, others, and there isn't actually the liberty and the progress that they fought for. You know what worries me, Dr. Mnyeza? It's like we don't learn. That happened, maybe that's 1980. We come to the year 2000, there's another contention in the country. It appears like even those that then sacrificed at that point and struggled also have come into a sense of entitlement. Uh, now, let me highlight that to you. Yes. You, you, and you, you are now touching a storm here. <laughs> yes. So, here we are. Let's be very honest and clear here. Yes. So, let's state the principle again. Mm. When a sacrifice is personalized yes. and not centered on God, because there is only one sacrifice, that is Jesus Christ. Amen. It will lead to an entitlement to that person who has made the sacrifice. Yes. That entitlement leads to a, a, sub, uh, um, a subjugation and oppression yes. of the very same people that they felt they were sacrificing for mm. or they were liberating. Mm which leads to no progress and actually leads to destruction and more strife. Yes. We then start that journey. Yes. In 1980. Yes. So we have people who sacrificed. Yes. And thank God that they did. Yes. And that was genuine. They became our liberators. Yes. They failed it at a leadership level. Yes. At a systematic level, yes. they failed to lead us into that liberty, into uh -huh. that progress, because they felt entitled. Mm -hmm. So we get 20 years down the road. Yes. We have people now realizing that these people are not giving us the liberty yes. and the freedom yes. and the progress and the prosperity that they said they would give us. Mm. There arose many who also started struggling yes. and made a similar sacrifice. Yes. So in our country, we then have, that was the formation of our opposition politics. Yes. Now, when that arose, yes. they also began to feel entitled oh. to the struggle mm. because they made certain sacrifices and therefore, we have two centers of power. One says, I am entitled because I liberated you. Yes. The other one is saying, I'm entitled because I am trying to liberate you from the liberators. Ah. So there's no convergence right now. Mm. There is no convergence because everybody is feeling entitled and not empowering the others. And so by entitlement, it now becomes camps rather than a convergence on the interests of Zimbabwe. That is what has now defined our polarity. Mm. Our polarity is based on the liberators who gave you independence mm -hmm. and those who are trying to liberate us from the liberators, <laughs> who both parties feel or both centers feel entitled. And therefore, we are not reaching a convergence. Uh -huh. We are not getting to a convergence which is overarching and bringing the nation together. Because everyone feels, if you are coming from there, you are my enemy. Yes. But if you're also coming from there, you're my enemy. So everyone is an enemy until there is convergence. That's why when Philip Schaff says that, uh, you know, in essentials, there must be unity. 
Yes. No, we must find what unites the liberators in those who are fighting freedom from the liberators. What is the common uh, essentials that are there? There's a, a, a spiritual father in this nation, Apostle God, who puts it in a very way, mm. important way. Mm. He asks the question, what is the common denominator? Yes. We must come up with a common denominator because yes. the common denominator as far as Jesus were, and, and the godly kingdom and the altars that we've been talking about is Jesus himself. Mm. So if, if it can't hang on Jesus, mm. there is no essential there. Yes. And we must recognize that Jesus paid the final sacrifice. So when you sacrifice, you're only sacrificing for a common agenda and that you must never feel entitled. So you oh. must add, allow others to participate because the struggle must now be common. Now, this is another thing that we want to mm. get onto. The struggle must become common and collective. Yes. So it must not bring an entitlement because that entitlement brings a personality cult which would then bring subjugation, oppression, and it brings lack of progress and it brings destruction in the environment that you are in and disunity, basically. So that's where we find ourselves. So we, we need to get to there uh, where we must converge and find the common denominator. Yes and say to ourselves, for this to happen, we must also make sure that it is a cause and whoever is making a personal sacrifice, they are making a personal sacrifice to a cause mm. and not for them to be entitled and become the next oppressor. Because once you, you the only time, Pastor Pace, let me tell you, whenever you feel entitled, you have now the ingredients and the nature of an oppressor. Yes. Yes. The moment you feel that, even if it is at a family level, when a father feels that they're entitled because they are the father, when the husband feels entitled that because they are the husband, they are actually oppressors. Mm -hmm. Because the best way to deal with that, which is where Jesus brought it to the, to the, to, 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 to the convergence point. He says, even the Son of Man came so that he can be a ransom for many. For many, yes. He didn't come in so that you can crown me king, but that I can become the ransom for many. He, he said, you, you must be servants for all. The greatest amongst you must be the servant. So he, he, he equalized the whole thing. In fact, it's very important. And he, he made himself not so entitled. Yes. Now, when Jesus comes to the cross, we read about it in Romans chapter 8, verse 16 to 17. Yes. When he, when he says, look, when we are children, we become sons. Yes. And then we become heirs of yes. God. Yes. And then we become co-heirs with Christ. Yes. Now, imagine Jesus comes down from heaven. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to, to 11. He, he, he comes down in the form of you and I. Yes. And in the form of a slave or a servant to all. Mm. Yet he was God incarnate. He was the creator of heaven and earth. But he came so that he would liberate you and me and to make you and me as co-heirs with him. Can you imagine not having oh, fought for powerful. anything? Yes. Can you imagine not yes. having to suffer for anything? Yes. Can you imagine not to have to struggle for anything? And I say, Percy, come. You have not done anything, but we're going to share the spoils of what has happened here in half. Wow. Not you getting 10% and I getting 90%. We are going to share the spoils 50-50. We are co-heirs. We are co-heirs. That nature of a citizen is what is God looking for. I've sacrificed, but my brother, come along. Come along. Now, that was a Davidic nature. Yes. You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 31, yes. uh, the Amalekites come. They plunder their wives, their property, and they take uh, um, the, the, the wives and children mm. of, of uh, David and his army. Yes. When he was in Ziklag. Yes. He goes there, and then they say, he asks God, he says, yes. shall I pursue them? Mm. And if I pursue them, will I recover? And God says, pursue, you will overcome, 
you will recover. And he did. So he takes a band of his, uh, his, his soldiers. He had trained these vagabonds and mm. these delinquents in society mm. to become soldiers. Mm. And he goes there, and halfway through, some of them says, ah, we don't think we want to, we are f afraid of the Amalekites. Mm. He let them be. He continued with the rest. Yes. And then he goes there. What does he do, Pastor Pesci? He goes, he, he pursues them, he overcomes them, and he recovers everything and all the spoils yes. that the Amalekites had. Yes. When he gets back, the ones who had gone to fight mm. are bickering with the ones who gave up midway the fight. Yes. Or midway to going to fight. Yes. And they say, we cannot share the spoils with these ones here who are cowards. <laughs> I'm just putting in my own uh, verbatim here. And these are cowards. These are sellouts, actually. Yes. These people should not be given anything. Guess what David says? Mm. David says, we will share with everybody equally. It's powerful. The ones who went to fight and the ones who didn't fight. That is a Christ nature. Now, when we understand that, it goes back to that saying by Peter uh, Scarf, who says, uh, in essentials, we must unite. Yes. In non-essentials, we must give liberty. Yes. But in all things, charity. Yes. Now, what it meant for David was he was putting on the Christ-like nature of co-heirship. He says, look, it doesn't matter whether you fought or you didn't fight. Guess what? You, share in you the are spoil. going to share in the spoil 50-50. Doc, let me just hold you a bit there. In 1 Samuel 30, 22 here, there's a description of those that did not want to give others. Yes. It says, then all the wicked and worthless men yeah. of those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. I mean, the Bible describes them as wicked and worthless. They having the heart that says, if I fight, only I will benefit. The Bible says it's wicked and worthless. worthless. Now, guess what? When you read that uh, verse 32 there. It, it, it actually highlights something. The ones who had won the war yes. and brought the, the spoils, yes. when they got back, they said, the only thing you will get <laughs> is your wives and children. <laughs> yes. But they didn't even stop there, Pastor Pace. Yes. You know where they stopped? Yes. They said, after we give you your wives and children, we are not going to allow you to, to stay. stay in our midst. <laughs> and that is the Be nature. Gone. Be gone immediately. We don't need people like you in our society. Oh. But David yes. is a citizen of heaven. Yes. And knew God's heart because the Bible says he was a man after God's heart. Yes. He said, enough is enough, guys. When you came here, you're all in debt. You're delinquent. You were dejected. Um, but now... We, I've trained you to be an army. Yes. Now, the very people who couldn't even get anything and benefit anything, yes. you now want to chase others away. Who gave you the right? And he says, everyone shares the spoils. They shared the spoil. The nation of Israel was being reborn or rebirthed mm. from a totally different angle. The army of Israel was being united from a totally... Uh, 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 you know, uh, uncustomed mm. place, yes. unusual place. And that army became the presidential guard of Israel. They were united. Mm. They were together now. But it started off by David saying, <clears throat> enough is enough. We share. Yes. So now in Zimbabwe, here's where we struggle. In our communities, here we, here we struggle. When we see each other, we always see each other with the eye of a political party. And so I hear you from a prism, not of what you're saying, no. but I consider where you come from. Yes. And already I, make a, I, I take a position so, by where you come from. So we see each other from the eye of entitlement. Mm. That you are this political party, but I'm more entitled than you. We never see it from the prism or from the lenses that say you and I are brother or as brother and sister. We are Zimbabweans. We are Zimbabweans and these are our essentials. 
And these are our non-essentials. But in everything, I embrace you. Mm. So we see each other from the political part. We see each other from which church do you go to? That's where we see each other from. Oh, you go to the, oh, no, I don't, then you're my enemy. That's Immediately, sad. you behave like these uh, soldiers that went to fight and the ones who couldn't fight. Mm -hmm. Say, look, you don't belong to us. Get away from us. Mm. Not knowing that the future holds for both parties. The future uh -huh. holds for both of us. And we are not working in that sort of dimension at all. We have one nation. We have one nation to build, actually. We think we've got uh, different nations to build. So we want to eliminate. You see, the thing in, in our country is, is, is very unchristlike. It is coming from an occult nature. Whenever I see the desire to eliminate you, it's occultic. Yes. But whenever I see the desire to embrace in our non-essentials and deal with our essentials, it is godly. It's a strong godly foundation. It's a strong godly foundation. So we've got to move from this occultic behavior of eliminating one another. The elimination is not just to see each other in different places. But yes. it has led us to actually, I will kill you. Because you differ with me. That's why we have been in a state, and I call it a state of civil war. That state of civil war has been birthed by a sense of entitlement because I struggled, because I sacrificed, I'm entitled. And then you also come up with another struggle, another sacrifice, and then you also feel entitled. And then we fight without a common cause or agenda that benefits both of us. Mm. So, that's, that, that's, so we differ from a church. So if I start the church, if I am the founder of this church, even if I go wayward, yes. guess what? You, as somebody who grew up in the church, I cannot confront you. No, you can't. Why? With the word of God. My goodness, you cannot confront me because we moved away from what it was. Because even in some cases, the church has moved from a godly altar to this occultic altar that says that because I started it, I'm entitled. Mm. And it's not building the citizen we want. Now, in the church, there is another citizenship, which is the body of Christ. And you know, in the book of Corinthians, uh, um, uh, Facebook and chapter 12, it talks about the different members of the body, but one body. One body, yes. So we have not moved to embrace the difference, even in church. The, the, the divisions that we find in church are caused by entitlement. Thinking that I am the only one who has revelation to the truth. I'm the only one who understands this truth. So there's a monopolizing Monopoli of but the it's, truth yes, to it's, myself. Yes, but it, I wish you could monopolize it by saying that I know it the most. But it's an entitlement which oppresses. So there is no other voice you want to hear from. You don't want to hear from a divergent or dissenting voices. You only want to hear what collaborates, what supports, what hails, what celebrates your view. So if I veer off the line, mm. there is no help to bring me back because I'm entitled not to hear anyone else and only accept what I think is correct. Yes. Mm. That's, I'm talking about these different institutions, yes. politics and church. Yes. So in both of those, yes. the nature is the same. Mm. So in politics, if a leader goes wayward, in Zimbabwean politics, there is no place to rebuke them. Aha. Uh -huh. We have experienced this for 40 years. There is no place to rebuke them. If you rebuke them, you are an enemy. You are a, actually, you get eliminated. You're not just an enemy. You get eliminated. In that circle, you get uh, ostracized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, 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 you are removed from the fellowship of the political system. It's like you have got leprosy. Yes, you are put outside the village. Mm. You will suffer there until you honor the leader even in their waywardness. Because the culture we created was that a leader can never be wrong. Uh -huh. Because he has become a demigod and entitled to the place there, whatever he says is right. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So we cannot stand up and correct them. Now, transpose that to the church. Many movements in churches today have suffered derailment, have suffered stagnation, have suffered error, have suffered abuse because they have failed to correct the man of God, mm. the woman of God, who has veered off track and has failed to embrace the holistic gospel. Where Paul says, I have given you, I've preached to you mm. the full gospel. Yes. And they're veered because of personal needs that have led them to entitlement. Yes. So they continue on that path that I'm still the man of God here. If you don't want to come to this church, leave. So you have got now followers who are, who, who are slaves. They're no longer liberated. Remember where, yes. where you started. We find a convergence. That convergence must give us liberty. Yes. That liberty must make us progress. Yes. You don't find that in church. Mm. You find many believers are now enslaved in their churches. Because of this strong sense of entitlement. Entitlement. Because it is a stronghold now that we must deal with. If we are going to get the citizen that we want, we must agree on essentials. We must have liberty on non-essentials, but in everything embrace in our diversities and show charity and love. You mentioned earlier about David. And it's yep. interesting that in 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, David is, there's something, something goes wrong in his personal life as leader. And Nathan comes to correct him. And David actually accepts the correction and takes responsibility. That's a, an amazing sign of leadership that we see there from David. Yeah, but you know where it starts from? Yes. It starts from his journey on killing Goliath. And ah, I want to take you there now. Wonderful. I want yes. to take you there. Let's, let's end off this yes. discussion with that valley of Ella experience. Yes. Where for 40 days and 40 nights, yes. the children of Israel were having a face-off mm -hmm. with the Philistines who were being led by Goliath. David is in the, is the pastures there, heading his father's goats and sheep, livestock. His father sends him to go and find or to get and send some supplies, food to his brothers. He's the youngest. Mm -hmm. He sends him and says, go and provide supplies. The, David's role was just a waiter in my business in yes. hospitality. He was a waiter. He wasn't even the chef. He wasn't even the hotel general manager. <laughs> he wasn't even a supervisor. <laughs> yes, he, he was did. a chef. He was a, a waiter to bring food to his more important brothers. Who felt entitled? So he gets to the battle scene in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He gets to the battle scene. And he, he sees his brothers struggling. He sees the armies of Israel struggling. He sees Goliath uh, mocking and abusing the armies of God. He calls them the armies of God. And uh, uh, I want to get there. And, and let me just get to that. He... <laughs> He gets, he gets there. So the first thing he's asking in verse 25, he says, now with all the standoff and face off, what will be given to the man or the person who defeats, kills this Philistine? Yes. He says, what will be done for the man? Because whilst he was asking that, you need to understand that the king had already got a price or a prize for, for anyone who defeats Goliath. And what was that? His daughter. He said, anyone who kills Goliath, I'll give him my, my daughter. But <laughs> you need to analyze David's question. He doesn't say what will be given says, what will be done mm -hmm. for the man? Yes. 
uh, who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. So he, he was defining a bigger problem, that there was a disgrace which is the citizenry of Israel was actually under disgrace. Cowering from Goliath. Yes, he wanted to redeem mm. the children of Israel from this disgrace, which is what we're talk, talking about is the citizen that God wants. We need a citizen that God wants, which says all for one, one wow. for all. Now, we, we don't have that in this nation yet. And we need to get there very quickly. And uh, once he's done, we, once he said that, says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? They defined the common, what does David do there? Uh, the essential. Common denominator. Common denominator. Who is the common denominator? Is this uncircumcised Philistine? He could have just said Philistine. But for the children of Israel, the children of the covenant, yes. through Abraham, their covenant was in the circumcision. Yes. So David had to pronounce the common denominator, which wasn't just a Philistine. It was because the Israelites were defined by their circumcision, circumcision. and not even by their class, and not even by uh, their, uh, you know. Very important. It, it was just defined by that they were, it, not even by their tribes. They were defined as the children of the covenant because of the circumcision that was given through Abraham. So he has to underline that. He says, look, in this battle, we are of the circumcision. That's what I am identified with. So he brought in personal identity to the fore. Which united. Them. Which united. There was now a convergence. There was now a common denominator, Pastor Ben. Mm -hmm. But the other secondary common denominator was that we have an enemy. Yes. The enemy is not you and I. The enemy is not how we see things differently. Yes. The enemy is not the ranks that we have in the Israelite army. Yes. The enemy is actually the Philistine. Mm -hmm. So he goes, he says, this uncircumcised, that he should defy the armies of the living God. Oh. <laughs> Now, he is getting to another dimension. This is a boy who has just come from the, uh, from the pastures. From the pastures yes. Yes. This is not a trained soldier. Mm. He has not been regimented into the army of Israel, not as yet. But he's just coming from the pastures, heading goats and sheep. His only experience, Pastor Percy, is one of killing a lion yes. and a bear. Yes. Defending what? The, the sheep. sheep. So that he is, carried the heart already. He, he had the heart to defend the common good. Mm -hmm. no, and that is his struggle and that was his sacrifice. His brothers did not know that. I see. His brothers, even if they knew, they did not appreciate that. That was like, you're a waiter today, you're a shepherd boy during the week or during the day. So, so please don't tell us nonsense. They felt entitled, but they still had an uncircumcised Philistine who had defied the armies of God. So the common denominator says, look, this, what I see you here, you are not just an army. Yes. You are the armies of God. Of God. Mm. <laughs> now, when we come together, when we are looking for the citizen that God wants, it must find that place where we find common identity. Pastor Pearson. Very important. We are not seeking common identity right now as a nation and as a people in our society. We are just looking at what do I benefit which has brought in this entitlement mm. we've been on. So and then they, they repeated to him what they've been saying and told him that this is what will be done for the man who kills him. So what are they repeating? They're saying you'll be given the king's wife. Yes. I mean the king's daughter. You'll be given, given the king's daughter. So that's what will happen. Do it, son. Let's see you. Mafika Zolo, you came today. Yes. You think we are stupid here, standing here for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you think we don't want we, to be the king's son? We, we, we don't want to son belong to the state house. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> and then Eliab, in verse 28, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, 
and he burned with anger. You know, do you know what entitlement gives you? Yes. Oh, it brings anger to you. Whenever you see the person who you think shouldn't be for a common cause, people become angry. Zimbabweans are angry. Oh. Oh, oh, no. So they are doing a cause that benefits all of us, but because it's not me it's, doing it. Yeah, and you don't you, belong you to my no camp. Right. And you don't belong to my camp. Oh. So earlier I'll be saying, look, you don't belong to the camp of the, uh, of the majors and the sergeant majors and the brigadiers and the real army here. Who are you? And then he, the Bible says you burned with anger at him and asked. Yes. Why have you come down here? Now, the first thing is that he's saying, look, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? <laughs> ah, we don't have enough time, Pastor Pesi. You are coming here to solve uh, big issues be, of Israel. Go and mind those few sheep pano, in the pastures. <laughs> now you come, you have left the sheep. And it's not just a lot of sheep. According to me and you, we know it's a few sheep. But David is not so much worried about a few sheep. It's in his heart. Yes. He is saying, those few sheep, yes. I defended them with my life. Yeah, oh, that is something new they are passing. The few sheep. I laid my life. I laid my life for it. That is a sacrifice that you, Eliab, don't have an idea of. I made sure that the one for all and all for one principle exists. And for a whole nation, Eliab, you're not brave enough to go and You're not brave enough life. to go and sacrifice your own life. I was going to sac I was sacrificing my life for sheep and not even for human beings. Mm. I was a steward, like we did in the last uh, session. I was a steward for sheep. Yet you can be a steward for human beings. Mm. I'm saying this is, if I was David, these are the conversations I'm having inside me. Mm. So he, and, and, and Eliab had to mock the responsibility. Mm -hmm. Have you ever known in Zimbabwe, if you come up with an initiative and it's not aligned to team A or team B, because in Zimbabwe we only got two teams, eh? Mm -hmm. The polarity is in two. You belong to that team or not to this team. If it is not aligned to team A or to team B, team A thinks that you belong to team B and team B thinks that you belong to team A. And when both of them come together and they realize that he doesn't belong to us, they then mock your initiative. And no one Both ever sides, thinks it's no one ever a th common, interest. common interest. Because we have not defined the common uh, and essential interest. Mm -hmm. So whenever you come up, because it is not aligned to team A or aligned to team B, guess what happens? You, co you come and mock it. So mm -hmm. earlier B mocks and he says, who have you left the few sheep? Which you must go back to. He has no picture that this guy would not be with us today. He did not kill the lion and the bear. So he says, and I know how conceited you are. And guess what mirror he's looking at? Prism you're talking about earlier. Yes. He's actually looking at himself. Who is conceited here? Exactly. The person conceited is actually Eliab. Yes. And he's seeing the, the conceitedness in David. Because of how he, he is his perceiving. Mind is uh, yes, the mirror he the construction is. Of his so mind. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. Now, he has to see the wickedness of his young brother who has defeated the lion and the bear. They are stuck with a Goliath who is not able to move because they can't move either. So he says, you are wicked. You came down here only to watch the battle. <laughs> this is entertainment for you. <laughs> and now, guess what David says? Let's just bring this to a head and to a close. And David says, now what have I done? Yes. Say, David... Can't I even speak? And then he turned away to someone else and brought up the matter. And the man answered him and said before, what David said was overhead and reported it to Saul and Saul sent for him. Remember, his answer earlier on was that is there not a cause? A cause. He was looking for a cause. 
David was always looking for a cause. So it wasn't the king's uh, daughter. It wasn't. It wasn't the king's daughter. He was not looking for a prize. He was looking for a cause. Mm. And you find this as we will go on further, that what builds a good citizen is always looking for a cause yes. and not for a prize. Uh -huh. Because a prize gives entitlement. Yes. A cause brings co-heirship. A cause brings a co-sharing. A, a, a cause bring, uh, uh, brings uh, um, uh, interdependence. Mm. A cause brings a liberty. A cause brings unity. And a cause brings love. Mm. And therefore, using my uh, example I was giving there, or the definition, progress will come. Ultimately, it's progress yes. and prosperity. Yes. So the nation of Israel, you find it prospers under David and not under Saul because David embraced a common denominator. Mm. So he is ushered to Saul. Let's just finish this off now. He is ushered to Saul. And Saul sits there and he says, Okay, so he moves from one place of entitled people, which is his brothers and the rest of the army. Yes. Who mock him. Yes. Then he goes to Saul. Saul says, <laughs> eh, Manangu, my child, that guy you are talking about, he's been a soldier since his youth. You were your only a youth. He's a man of war. He's a man of war. And now you are telling me you want to confront him. You know how we have mocked initiatives that are brought by simple people in our communities. Um, initiatives that are brought by people who don't have the same background as you share. Or let me put in the context of our conversation today, the people who, have, who you have shared the struggle with or who you have shared the sacrifices with and they don't come from there. They come from somebody else who are not the same people. The tendency is to mock them first. Than to listen. Than to, to listen for a common, common denominator. Uh -huh. So Saul doesn't. Saul just says, look, you're going to waste our time. This guy is going to just devour you. Because we've been here for 40 days and 40 nights. And by now you should know that we are not idiots. We are not stupid. We are not uh, uh, weak. Uh, we are actually brave, trained soldiers. Me, a soul, I was picked to be king because I would lead the armies of Israel into war. That's why I'm here. But guess what Saul was putting on? Self-preservation, mm. which is what I want to end off with. The angle of self-entitlement or entitlement to those who feel they own the struggle, they own the sacrifice, they've got the intellectual property of the struggle, is that they eventually are just looking for self-preservation. And I want this to be noted here. Those who are self, uh, uh, those who are entitled do that to eventually oppress and prejudice those who they feel that they have emancipated. Yet the actual objective, Pastor Percy, yes. is self-preservation. Not common denominator. No, they will not go for another sacrifice. So Saul has preserved himself as the king, but guess what he's putting on? An armor mm -hmm. that he might not be killed. He actually says, try this. David tries the soul's armor. It doesn't work for him. He says, I will go barefooted. I will go with a sling and five stones that I'll pick up from there. And we know the full story. Only one stone took down Goliath. It's the power of the common denominator. The fear that was amongst the soldiers in their ranks. Yes. The fear that was on Saul was because they wanted to preserve themselves. Yes. David, because he had come from a place where he didn't preserve himself with the sheep and goats. You lay your life. He laid his life for the sheep and goats. He was faithful with the sheep and goats. And God knew, because he had a heart that was after God's own heart, that even if he went without a weapon towards Goliath, 
God was going to be his, his, <laughs> his weapon. He goes because in the name of the Lord. He says, I come to you in the name of of the Almighty. Yes. He says, I do not come to you with a javelin, yes. spear, yes. or sword, yes. but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And because of that, I have no desire to preserve myself. Yes. So I don't fear you. And bang, that was the end of it. Mm. So what has sacrificed our progress and our prosperity is entitlement, which has caused prejudice which has caused subjugation, which has caused oppression, and has not brought us to a convergence, which naturally should bring liberty, and that liberty would bring us to prosperity and progress. progress. Mm -hmm. And we have not got there, because the entitled lot of Team A and Team B is self-preservation. Mm. Nothing else. We want to preserve ourselves. The corruption we have found in this country is about self-preservation. The fear that we found in this country is about self-preservation. The lack of progress and prosperity is because the few feel entitled and they want to preserve themselves. I want to end there, Pastor Bessie. Because next week, we're going to go deeper on this yes. matter. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the citizen that God wants. Praise God. No, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mnyeza. This is very powerful. It's been another interesting session indeed. And as you can see, we were trying very hard. It's two preachers here to make sure that we don't start preaching here because we could feel what God would want us to understand as a people and what we should become. You know, um, Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Even in the matter of being in the kingdom of God, there is one denominator, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How we pray that he who knows and understands the issues of unity, of oneness, can help us as a nation to find one another. May God bless you. But before we go, the things that matter to us a lot, in fact, that are number one, are that we all come to know Christ so that we have the one denominator of Jesus Christ. Dr. Mnyeza, please lead those that are watching who may have enjoyed what we're talking about but may not know Jesus Christ so that they can also become with one with you and I as having the com common denominator of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor Percy. Um, the issue is to move from a personal sacrifice that leads to entitlement yes. and that leads to preservation. Yes. What we need to move is to a Christ-centered struggle and sacrifice. Amen. That brings salvation, liberty, and prosperity. Amen. So in order to do that, um, we all need to come to the full knowledge that there's only one sacrifice that was made. Yes. And that is Jesus Christ. There is no need for any other sacrifice. Amen. That when we acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, we are saved. So immediately our spirit is saved. Then we take the journey of sanctification in this life. Whilst we're on this earth, we go through sanctification, which is renewal, uh, uh, transformation, which, uh, which goes through all being separated from this wicked world mm. and walk the way of Christ. Ultimately, when he comes or when we die, we become glorified with him. Amen. So, and, 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 and please uh, follow after me and, and pray after me and say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today as a child who has not found salvation. I honor you for what you have done. I accept the sacrifice that you have done, which is dying on the cross, being buried, rising again on the third day, ascending into heaven, seated on the right hand of the Father, and that one of these days you will come back, and that my salvation is clear and is complete. It is finished. Today I choose you to be my Lord and Savior. I choose to walk in your ways. I choose to obey your word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may become sanctified, in that on that day when you appear, I will be glorified with you. 
Give me strength to commune. Give me strength to walk. Give me strength to endure my struggle. That whatever sacrifice I make, I make in you because you are the only sacrifice. I ask this and I thank you for what you have done in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of Borodo Community Church today. It was such a delight to have you with us. Remember, you too can be a responsible citizen. What are you going to do this week and for the rest of your life to step up on being a responsible citizen? May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you. May he cause his countenance to shine upon you. Have a blessed week and take good care of yourself. Thank you.